So let me go back to Chester. This goes back way to the uh, uh, 1963. Um, that fall of 1963, and I'm at that time, I'm a sophomore in college um, at Swarthmore, which is outside of Pennsylvania. And I was really, really naive. I did not know anything. Um, I had grown up in the country, in Connecticut. My world had been really isolated. But I had friends that we were into the beat poets together. And we, were, we had heard about the movement, and we were desperately trying to find it in high school, not very successfully. But once I got to Swarthmore, obviously, I found it. So this is when I'm a sophomore. That fall of 1963, four young black girls were killed in a bombing of a black church in Birmingham, a church that had allowed civil rights workers to meet there. The pictures of the rubble were sickening. My room was still in parish. This is a, a passage about another moment of decision. My room was still in parish, the huge old building that had served for more than 100 years as the hub of the campus. One day in November, before climbing the stairs to return to my room after a late afternoon class, I stopped to look over the student bulletin board. My eyes fell on a pale orange sheet of paper on which someone had carefully written by hand, Franklin School Boycott, Come Support CFFN. The leaflet went on to explain, the Committee for Freedom Now, CFFN, and parents of children at Franklin Elementary School are boycotting Franklin School because of the dangerously poor conditions at the 95% Negro school in Chester. CFFN had decided to focus on the worst school in Chester, a nearby decaying industrial city. Now parents and local community members had picketed and protested for three days at the school, the school board, and the city council. They needed reinforcements to close the school down again the next morning. Picketers might face more arrests. I looked away from the bulletin board into the sunlight to get my bearings. I tried to consider the possibility, indeed the likelihood of arrest, but this idea was overwhelming. In my world, only bad girls got arrested, and by doing so, I would become one. Once I started down this path, I knew I would never turn back. My arrest would make it public, especially to my family, and I knew that the terms of reconciliation would not be terms I wanted to accept. I counterposed this image of the bad girls with the thought of Gloria Richardson and all the women sitting around in that living room. This was from when I had gone to Cambridge, Maryland the previous spring on a trip led by a a student at Swarthmore to support the Woolworth boycotts in Cambridge, Maryland. Um, even though they had jobs to lose and children to protect, they had gone to jail. They risked the firebombing of their homes. By comparison, I was risking little that I could think of except missing class and incurring my parents' wrath. I looked at the bottom of the leaflet to see where students were meeting to take the short bus ride to Chester. Then I turned and joined the clusters of young women climbing the stairs to their rooms. I had made a decision. The next morning I abandoned my classes and took the bus with several others to join the peaceful picket line in front of the school. Most of the picketers were members of the local school community, parents and children, and several students from Swarthmore, Grinoir, and Haverford. The protesters from the day before were still in jail. We marched around in a circle, some people holding signs. I learned that Franklin School had been built to house 500 students, but it now held 1,200. The library was just a single desk and a few books in the hallway. Only two working toilets served the entire building. On the picket line, we chanted and sang. Although lights were on in the school, no one entered while we were there. Oh, freedom, we sang. Several policemen edgily watched the goings-on for about 15 minutes, at which point several police cars and big boxy paddy wagons pulled up on the curb. The police ordered us to disperse and in the same breath began to direct us towards the paddy wagons. Several of the women with small children started to move away from the line because they didn't want to get arrested. 
The police, however, with arms reaching out, insisted they turn around and push them into the wagons. I didn't see the police hit anyone, but they were yelling intimidating orders and threats. Some of the children, as young as three and four, started to cry. I stretched to reach the high step into the back of the paddy wagon, along with a crowd of mostly women and children. Two benches had been attached to either side of the box, but those were already filled. The rest of us had to stand stooped over or sit on our haunches on the dirty floor. Even while everyone was trying to find a place to anchor themselves, the back door slammed closed and the bright sunlight shuts was suddenly shut out. For a few seconds, I took in the musty metallic smells of the dirty truck bed, which was quickly beginning to mingle with the warm, sweet smells of women and children packed into the van. A confused cacophony of voices filled the space as people rushed to secure the children. Then we heard the song coming from another wagon, and someone in our wagon picked up the tune. The frightened cries of children quieted as the music gave us strength. I didn't know this song, but by the second chorus, I could join in. The chord progressions of the music were familiar to me from my own years of church singing. After a blessedly short ride, during which the people who were standing were thrown around, we were crammed into two small cells intended the, with the women, intended perhaps for no more than 12 people. After a long 45 minutes, with the silence between songs growing longer because we were tired and thirsty, a large cop came up to the locked door of the cell to say that all the children should come out so they could get water and go to the bathroom. With considerable misgiving, the mothers sent their children out, and then fulfilling their worst fears, the children did not return. A half hour passed. Mothers banged on the cell, demanding to know what had happened to the children. But the police remained, responded with silence. And then it goes, goes on. I don't want to read for the whole time. But we ended up in the state prison, which at that time was segregated. So we had a sit in And um, this was like a typical story from the civil rights at that time movement. But that was sort of what got me started as an activist. Um, because I had actually gone to the SDS meetings when I was a freshman, but they were a whole bunch of men talking about stuff I couldn't understand, and so I didn't go back. And it was this event that pulled me back into the movement. So um, now I know somebody must have a comment or a question. 